Welcome to Innovations <clears throat> Driving the Leading Edge of Healthcare. I'm delighted today to speak with you and have an opportunity to share some of the insights we have in the innovation that's coming in healthcare. And today I'm going to tell you a story about the healthcare practices and practitioners that we work with all across the country that have given us a bird's eye view into some of these innovations that are happening. So we have a very interesting landscape because we can see the forest when most of the practices are just looking at the individual trees. So what's exciting about that, so in this main story, there's always a character. And the character in our story today is the pendulum of healthcare. Now the pendulum of healthcare shifted hard in one direction over the last century. And with that shift, some good things happened, but also some really catastrophic things happened in our healthcare. And I'm gonna share those with you today. But before I get into that, the good news is the shift is changing and it's coming back in another direction that I'm gonna share with you. But before I get into the story, I wanna talk about some common wisdom through the ages. So some of the wisest people I know are our mothers. And mom's wisdom, how many of you have heard an apple a day keeps the doctor away? eat your vegetables. Moms have been saying that for generations. Also, something a little bit more recent, because I say it, <laughs> is eat the rainbow. I just call this common sense wisdom, right? We've all heard you are what you eat. We are, we are what we eat. So the new mantra in our house is eat the rainbow so everything on the plate we try to have every color of the rainbow represented because as you can see in that diagram there's some pretty amazing foods in there and the nutrition that comes from it can't be denied and then one of my favorite characters driving wisdom at least through my childhood and i'm going to date myself here is popeye and popeye gave us lots of good reasons to eat our vegetables. So all of this wisdom throughout the ages was brought on the shoulders of Hippocrates. So Hippocrates, the father of medicine, you've all heard this quote before, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. I'll say that again. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So many of you have probably heard of the Hippocratic Oath. And the Hippocratic Oath is something that every doctor takes when, he goes to, when they go to medical school. And I'm going to read the Hippocratic Oath to you, if I can find it. Okay. The Hippocratic Oath is a sworn agreement, and this is simply stated. Okay, I don't have the actual one. The Hippocratic Oath is a sworn agreement made by physicians when they become doctors. It includes a promise to share knowledge, to help the ill and not cause harm, and to never give a deadly drug or help another to use one. So when I hear that and when I'm listening to that, I'm thinking about all those pharmaceutical commercials that I hear. And then at the end of the pharmaceutical commercials, we hear all those adverse reactions. And those adverse reactions many time include, can cause serious illness or injury, can cause death. Have we heard that before? Yeah. So let me go back to the Hippocratic Oath again. To help the ill and not cause harm, and to never give a deadly drug, or to help another to use one. My job today is not to demonize the pharmaceutical industry or doctors, but we can't talk about what's happened to our healthcare system without identifying some of the root cause problems that brought us here. So again, the good news, there are changes coming and good things happening as that shift happens. So in addition to nutrition and food, which is one of the key players in, in, in gaining and optimizing health throughout the time, 
one of my favorites, in addition to health and nutrition, or food and nutrition, is sleep. We've all heard the great benefits of sleep. Sleep does amazing things for us. It allows us to show up physically and mentally with high functioning the next day. It allows our bodies to heal from infection and build immunity. It allows our bodies to have optimum metabolism and also reduce the risk of chronic infection. And all of that, in addition to nutrition and sleep and all the others that are coming, are based in scientific evidence. Just Google any of them as we go through this. Movement. This is exercise, of course. We all know how important exercise is. But movement doesn't necessarily require effort, but it does require action. So movement in our bodies includes circulation, digestion. It allows our bodies to uh, metabolize food. It also allows our bodies to move the um, hormone balances through. And it also allows us to detoxify and respire. Another optimum health key factor is purpose, right? This is why we jump out of bed in the morning. This is why we set goals. This connects us to our higher power and sharing the gifts with other people. It gives us a sense of identity. Having a strong community. There have been studies on this, scientific studies about how important it is to have a strong community for wholeness. People that are connected in ways that bring values and beliefs and goals all into alignment, those are people that have fulfilled lives. Again, more scientific studies on all of this. Mindfulness, gosh, this is something I really struggle with. Uh, you know, I work hard, uh, I have, I founded this company and there's lots of times throughout the day I have to stop because we can get a little bit overwhelmed with what we should have done yesterday, what's coming tomorrow. Mindfulness allows us to stay grounded in the present. It allows us not to have to ruminate on what happened in the past or anticipating with anxiety or stress with what's about to happen in the future. Mindfulness allows us to look at our feelings and our emotions without judgment. Without judgment. Resilience, boy, this is something that uh, we all need from time to time. Our ability to not let those highs get too high or the lows too low. It brings some balance into our lives and it allows us to be able to um, put ourselves in a place where we're not overwhelmed and we don't have the anxiety and stresses of our lives tearing us apart. So the resilience training and our ability to cope, particularly in stressful times, is really important. And it is a factor of optimum health. And finally, energy flow. So energy flow allows us to show up with the greatest intention and motivation. It allows us to be able to be creative in our highest places. So when we clear space, whether that's physically in our homes or our offices and our families, our personal space, it allows for that creative flow to come in. So if these known factors of optimum health have been around for ages, okay, they help us physically, mentally, and emotionally for decades, for centuries we've done this. And if mom knew it, common sense says it, Hippocrates said it, and Popeye, of course, said it. So what happened to our healthcare system? <laughs> okay. Okay. So most of us, everybody in this room, actually, has grown up in conventional medicine. This is the only medicine we've known, right? This is it. But conventional medicine as we know it has only been around for a century, since 1913. Not that long. So before that, we were doing all of those things, focusing on all those eight key factors. 
So what happened was healthcare as a profession and a calling and these clinicians that were looking at themselves as healers, that pendulum swung hard <laughs> and turned healthcare as a business. So with opportunity, because there's been tremendous advancements in not only technology on the medical side, but also in human health and healing, it created a tremendous business opportunity. So that pendulum swung hard. And with the business as an industry of healthcare, it also brought a bunch of network of industries, including pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, medical schools, and huge healthcare systems. So again, this is conventional medicine as we know it. I like to refer to it as symptom-based. And symptom-based means you go to the doctor, what's wrong with you, guess what happens next? You get a prescription. Conversely, the other side of the pendulum where the clinicians came from before healthcare turned into a business and has a calling is focused in root cause medicine. So root cause medicine, they're looking at the whole system of the body. They're looking at it all in totality, not just the head, not just the gut, not just the brain. They're looking at it in the whole spectrum of this, this individual that's coming to see them and treat them, not just the symptom or the diagnosis. So this is where the pendulum swung, business as healthcare. Sorry, healthcare as business but we're seeing some trends that are moving in the right direction. So there's hope. Okay, so let's just do a comparison right now in the approaches to healthcare. So on the left side, we have conventional medicine. On the right side, we've got root cause medicine. And I just wanna compare that for a minute of what this looks like when you go to the doctor. So our appointment FaceTimes According to uh, the NIH, 15.7 minutes per appointment. I think that's pretty generous. I've seen nine to 11 minutes, but let's just go with that for a minute, 15.7 minutes. When you walk in to see a functional or an integrative medicine doctor, now there are MDs and DOs. They're not, you know, they're, they're the real deal. You're gonna spend 60 to 90 minutes in an initial meeting, an initial appointment. Follow-ups can be anywhere between 60 to 120. So just the time alone is a major factor and a major differentiator. Testing that you're gonna get, the testing in conventional medicine is driven by what the insurance company is gonna be paying. So remember, when you walk into the doctor, the first thing you've checked is does this doctor take my insurance? Always, right? And then the testing is gonna be driven by what the insurance companies are gonna pay for and reimburse the doctor, because it's a business model, and that's how doctors get paid, and that's the reality of it. On the root cause-based medicine side, there are literally hundreds of tests, and they're looking at the whole system and the whole body. They're not just looking at the symptom or the diagnosis. The treatment paths are also gonna be very different. Many times, the treatments in conventional medicine are going to be pharmaceutical or discussion about surgery, perhaps, or whatever the insurance company's gonna allow to happen. Root cause medicine, we've got comprehensive plan, and lots of times they're um, done in conjunction with a health coach, and a health coach is there to really put the plan into action, hold the patient accountable. See, in root cause medicine, as a patient, because I've been a patient, you have to participate in your own rescue, right? We're not looking at pharmaceuticals. We're trying to figure out why we have disease and we have to be willing to make some changes. So with that healthcare plan, 
there has to be some accountability on the patient side. And you have to be willing to do that. The path, many times, um, in, <laughs> include the symptoms that you went in for, but then there's also pharmaceuticals behind that to counteract the symptoms that you're now having because of that medication. So lots of times there's two, three, four, many more after that. And then on functional and integrative, we're gonna leverage the body's innate ability to heal along with obviously protocols for whatever the issue is. So as I lay this comparison out quickly, just wanted to illustrate some high points about some of the biggest differences that made that pendulum swing from ancient wisdom of healthcare that we knew into the business that it currently is. So there's always consequences to this, right? So those bubbles that were bright orange last time now are grayed out. I want you to think now about the last time you went to your doctor and you had a visit with your doctor. Of these eight attributes of optimum health and wellness, how many of, your do how many of those did your doctor ask you about? Did your doctor ask you if you're getting enough sleep? Probably, That's, they usually ask that one. Did they ask you if you have a sense of purpose? So just, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but just think about that in terms of your own relationship with your doctor and how interested he or she is in being able to tap into some of those eight attributes of optimum health probably went something more like this. You went in, you spent 15.7 minutes, you quickly told him what was wrong, he quickly went through his Rolodex in his brain, thinking about the prescription drug that he was gonna write to shut down the symptoms. It's usually what happens, rinse and repeat, or you had a conversation about surgery. Typically, there's not many conversations that are had about why. You're in with complaining about heart disease. I'm gonna write you a statin. I'm not gonna to try to figure out why you have heart disease because I've got five other patients that I need to see in an hour. Again, it's business, it's healthcare as a business. And this is now shifting and I, we're seeing it every single day in our work. So let's hear what the CDC has to say about this. This is not just me. This is the CDC. Let's hear what they have to say about it. These numbers are staggering. So currently right now, 117 million people have one or more chronic health condition. A chronic health condition is defined as an illness that lasts for more than one year and needs ongoing medical help. Well, in 1965, only 4% of the entire population had a chronic disease. That was 55 years ago. What in the world is going on? How is this happening? And worse, 46% of our children have chronic illnesses. So now let's talk about the pharmaceuticals that are written, the drugs. From 1997 to 2016, 4.5 billion prescriptions were written. That was an 85% increase year over year from 1997. But the population only rose by 21% during that time. I'm not a math whiz, but what is happening is pharmaceutical part of the business of healthcare? I see some people nodding, it's okay. Yeah, it is. Anybody heard of Johns Hopkins? Johns Hopkins has identified that medical errors is the third leading cause of death. It's not a mystery. We know why this is happening. It's happening because there's no time because healthcare is a business. And I, you can tell I'm pretty passionate about this. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute.
So the great news is the pendulum is swinging the other direction. Okay, we talk, I was talking to um, Don. Yes, I was talking to Don a few minutes ago before this started. And um, we, were, we were discussing about the shortage of healthcare practitioners, doctors and nurses. You've all heard about the healthcare shortage, yeah? Okay. Well, they're not leaving medicine. They're just leaving conventional medicine because they realize that their patients are not getting better. I talked to a doctor the other day that's been in the business, the business for 40 years. And he said, my patients are sicker than they've ever been. And as a doctor, that's disgusting. And there's nothing I can do about it. So they're leaving conventional medicine in droves. They're tired of being overworked, underappreciated, not having a work-life balance, not making any money. They can't. And their patients are getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And the patients are sick and tired of being sick and tired. I've been there. So the good news is, is that pendulum is swinging the other direction again. Hallelujah. Because they're putting themselves in a position where they're looking at taking control of their health again, being able to heal at the levels that they can have some control over. And the good news is, is that they finally have a doctor or doctors or a team of doctors that are looking at their whole body systems, not just the diagnosis. Okay, I know you've all been waiting for this one. <laughs> Did I advance it again? Okay. So my story is not unique. And many of you probably sitting here today, well, based on the statistics, I can tell you that there's more than one of you in here that has a chronic illness. Okay. So in 2014, I started experiencing some rather unpleasant symptoms that I had never had before. My hair started falling out. I started gaining weight like it was my job. Brain fog, massive fatigue. My mood swings were all over the place. Now at the time I was 47, so I was approaching menopause and that's okay to be expected, but not some of the other stuff that was happening. So I go to my doctor. Yeah, we're gonna do blood tests and urine. So we do all that. It's covered by the insurance. So guess what, the labs come back normal. Everything's fine. Because the labs are, are, are based on your age and sex. That's it, nothing else. So my labs were normal, everything was fine. But what's happening with my hair? Why am I gaining weight like this? It's never happened before. Well, guess what, They're, they have no answer. There's no explanation, but let's try this medication. Let's see if this is gonna work. Okay, well I didn't know. Sure, so I did it, took it on. Fast forward another eight months or so, same thing. No change, but now I have a different medication. Again, I don't know. So I go back again. So anyway, I don't wanna bore you. Fast forward to 2017. So I have an undiagnosed autoimmune disorder where my, um, my body is building up these antibodies attacking my thyroid and sending everything into turmoil. So in 2017, I went to an endocrinologist, still didn't know, so he wrote me another prescription, but this time he wrote me a prescription for an antidepressant. And I felt like I got hit in the forehead because I thought, an antidepressant? I'm not depressed. Something is wrong. You need the antidepressant. You don't know. And I realized at that moment he didn't know when everything in your toolbox is only a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I knew it. So I politely left, not really, I politely left the office. For those that know you, mean, <laughs> I, I left the office and I moved on. And I found a functional medicine doctor that spent the time 
asking the questions, we ran a whole bunch of tests, and we found out what was wrong. And we found out how to fix it. So I was able to make some lifestyle modifications, make some changes to my diet, and now here we are five years later, my autoimmune disorder is in remission, and I'm on, not on any medication. So again, my story's not unique, but it certainly is something that I'm passionate about, because once you see it, you can't unsee it. Let me just take a quick drink for a minute. So you heard from me as a patient. This is one of the doctors that has a similar story. Now, Dr. Christine Gedrick, she has a very successful practice in New Jersey. When she was a first year resident at a very, very competitive residency program in New York City, she got so sick. She got so sick she was working 100 hours a week she had just run a marathon. She was developing an ulcer. She got so sick she had to leave medical or she, she had to leave her residency. So it wasn't only until she went to see an integrative medicine doctor, her mother dragged her there, say you need to find out what's happening, because the pharmaceutical drugs that she was taking landed her in the ICU in an almost fatal position. Not fetal, but fatal position. So she healed, she got better, and through integrative medicine, she was able to do that and make that journey. In 2019, she wrote this book, A Nation Un Unwell. It's a really great read. If any of you are interested, it's, it's a fantastic book, chocked full of tons of information and lots of common sense wisdom. In her book, she says, as physicians, we are trained, I'm not going to quote it, but we, as, as physicians, we're trained to listen to the symptoms, think about the drug, write the prescription, and then disregard everything else they're saying. We've heard that before from other doctors, not just her. So she makes an analogy and she says, you know, when we take prescription drugs, that is the equivalent of a house on fire you're in bed at night, you jump up, disable the smoke detector, and then go back to bed as the fire still rages on. Okay, it just shuts down the symptoms. Again, her story is not unique. We have dozens and dozens and dozens of these. The pendulum is swinging back. Okay. So this leads me into now, here we are in 2022, and we started our healthcare company, my business partner over here, Rich Hoffman, and I started this company in 2019, and we wanted to turn our passion and purpose into a profession. And we didn't start Mind Body Talent just because we wanted to be great healthcare recruiters, although we are pretty darn good at it. We want to do our part because we are passionate about helping this pendulum swing back to the direction it needs to go. To be able to put the hands and the control and the care back in the patients and the practitioners. That's how we can do our part. We're not clinicians, not doctors, but we hear this stuff all day long. And we wanna be able to do our part. So we work with functional and integrative medicine practices all over the country to help them find the talent so those conventional medicine people that are leaving, trying to find them placed in functional medicine, root cause medicine. So our functional and integrative medicine doctors that we work with, they're all looking at these complex diseases just like they do in conventional medicine. You've, there's just a few of them here. There's a gazillion more, we all know. These are you know, probably some of the top ones. As we look at, I keep pointing at the wrong direction. <laughs> As we look at the common threads that they're looking at to heal some of these chronic illnesses and address some of these complex diseases, they're looking at things 
as a system, as a whole body. Conventional medicine doctors, most of them, they don't even, they've never even heard of the microbiome and the, and the gut-brain connection, mycotoxins. These are things that are like foreign to them. And these are things that cause these diseases that are, that are going unchecked, undiagnosed. My job is not to go through all of these and I mean, I understand what they all are and I'm not gonna go through them, but my point is is that the pendulum is swinging back because these doctors wanna know, why do you have diabetes? The first thing they're gonna look at is metabolic imbalance, your sugar. They're not gonna look at writing a prescription for insulin. They wanna look at longevity and quality of life. Again, that pendulum is swinging back. All right, I've got two, th excuse me, three more stories to share with you inside the big story of that pendulum of healthcare swinging back. So the first one is Dr. Terry Walls. Dr. Terry Walls is a clinical professor of medicine at the University of Iowa. She also has a private practice. Um, she's written over 60 peer-reviewed studies, clinical research. She's a published author. She's not only a doctor, but she's a patient of a chronic illness known as multiple sclerosis. She's in secondary stage multiple sclerosis. In 2000, she started. By 2007, she was in a tilt reclining wheelchair and she had done all of the, med she had done all of the treatment that medicine said she should do, including chemotherapy. So in 2000, um, in 2007, she decided that she was on a slippery slope in a fast decline, and she was in a wheelchair. She still had a medical practice. She had two small children, and she wanted to stop. So she did some work on the mitochondria, on her mitochondria. She did, she did all this research on herself, and she wanted to figure out how could she slow the progression if not reverse MS, multiple sclerosis. So she decided she was gonna come up with a diet. What does she got to lose? She's got nothing to lose. She's a really smart woman, she's a doctor. So she did all this research on mitochondria and trying to find the right foods and the right combinations of what she can eat to feed her mitochondria so her disease doesn't continue to progress. After she started her diet, three months later, from a wheelchair, she got on her bicycle and rode around the block for the first time in a decade. In 2008, so it was about nine months later after her first change in diet, she, ran, she rode her bicycle 18 miles. Dr. Terry Walls today is walking, she doesn't have a cane. Is she symptom free? No. But is she in a wheelchair? No way. And she has slowed down the progression of her autoimmune disease. She's written a book called The Walls Protocol. Um, there's lots and lots of doctors in functional medicine that absolutely adopt the Walls Protocol. And the good news is, is that she shared that information. She doesn't just keep it to herself. That's another thing about that community. They share the knowledge. And these are adopted by doctors that apply the science. Remember, I said she's a clinically researched professor, scientifically based medicine. She is sharing this knowledge with other providers that are helping their patients with all these other autoimmune disorders. Again, a great story of the pendulum swinging back. Oh. I almost forgot to mention one of the most best part of this. When Terry Walls came out with her protocol and her diet, the MS Society absolutely, um, what's the word I'm looking for, Rich? Banned her from speaking <laughs> at any of their conferences. Surprise, right? Well, now to date, 
Terry Walls has received $1.5 billion in funding, sorry, million dollars in funding for the treatment of MS in the scientific clinical trials. So she's got somebody's attention. Another great pioneer in the world of cognitive health and cognitive decline, Alzheimer's is Dr. Dale Bredesen. He's in California. He caught my attention and Rich's attention last year. He did a, 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 a docu-series called The End of Alzheimer's. And he has a company called Apollo Health. And Apollo, on the very first page of his landing page, says Alzheimer's is a choice. That's pretty bold, isn't it? And as I started listening to the docu-series and I started listening to these people with cognitive decline and Alzheimer's and could understand why and how. And one of the most startling statistics, and you saw it right up there at the top, the average age of a person living with dementia today is 49 years old. This is not an old person's disease. And then as we look at the increase between age 30 and 44, like why is this happening? Is this our farming practices? Is this the water we're drinking? Is this the pharmaceutical drugs? Is it the great Amer this, the, the standard American diet, also known as SAD? I mean, I don't know, I think so. It's gotta be a factor, it's gotta be in there somehow. So, the exciting work that Dale Bredesen is doing, and again, I could go way down a rabbit hole and talk about this, but the exciting part of this is the blood-brain barrier and understanding how that works, right? Again, conventional medicine doctors are not looking at this. I wish I had this statistic on here that came from the, docu the docu-series that I saw because it talked about um, uh, see, dementia, I totally lost my train of thought, okay? Right on, right, I was killing it till there, right? Yeah, I know, okay. We're gonna edit that part, Elliot, okay? <laughs> um, okay, I'll come back to it. <laughs> uh, again, the good news is that it is swinging in the other direction. I know you keep hearing that, but it's true and it's exciting and it's hopeful. And the last group that I want to talk about is the pediatrics, the kids. We have kids all over the country that are suffering. Okay, how everybody here is, you know, nobody here is a kid. When you were a kid, when you were at the lunchroom at school, how many of the kids had peanut allergies? A anybody? Today, how many kids have peanut allergies? Why? Why do we have peanut allergies? Why are there so many kids suffering with autism and, and autism spectrum disorders? Obesity. That sad diet again. And guess what, folks? The kids are not the ones running up to the grocery checkout paying for the groceries that were in the cart. They didn't make those purchasing decisions. And, and and obesity and, and being overweight for kids is really a scary thing. It's a scary proposition because we know that the first five years of their life set the tone for their eating habits, for how they're thinking about themselves mentally, their social interactions with other kids. This is scary stuff. And if we can't take care of our kids, we, we, we've got a bigger problem than a broken healthcare system. And it's got to start somewhere else. Again, the pendulum is switching. It's shifting. So the pendulum shifted because patients needed more answers. Doctors wanted more resources. They got tired of being sick and tired, and they got tired of not having the answers. And there's lots of doctors that we talk to in practices all over the country that, that certainly 
are open to learning something new and certainly open to coming back to a, a, a place in medicine that is rooted in common sense but also grounded in science. Okay, so it's, it's both. It's not one or the other. It's both. So here we are. Um, again, this is an opportunity for all of us to push that pendulum, take control of it ourselves, to be able to participate in our own rescue, to be accountable for some of the lifestyle choices that we're making in our lives that put our health either at risk or on the path to wellness. There are lots and lots of ways to do that. Obviously, you can find a functional and integrative medicine doctor. There's lots of them here in St. Louis. Lots doing telehealth, too. And share this knowledge with other people you know, too. Share what you learned today. Don't keep this a secret. This is a big deal. And, you know, if you can eat the rainbow, at least 80% of the time, try to do your best. Because those small little decisions obviously make big impact and choices, and that pushes the pendulum again, right? Because we're not feeding the broken business of healthcare. We're taking control of that. Um, there's tons of apps, especially the meditation ones. And um, I don't know if any of you have been seeing when I walk, I've got this white thing on my arm. Does anybody know what a continuous glucose monitor is? A CGM? Okay. So as I'm, you know, doing my life, I'm having all this data collected in my arm, and it's all about my glucose. I'm not diabetic, I'm not pre-diabetic, but I do try to keep track of what I eat because as we just saw, glucose, diabetes, out of control weight, that is the leading cause of most of these chronic health conditions that are here. So bananas are healthy, right? But I can't eat bananas because it spikes my blood sugar. And then all that insulin comes in my body because I don't want to be insulin resistant because then I'll get diabetes or I'll get Alzheimer's or dementia. Those are all things that I'm aware of now. So that data that's collected on my glucose goes back to my doctor and it's monitored. And then I get in trouble because when it spikes, she knows I ate a bowl of ice cream. <laughs> Just blame it on the kids. Okay. So uh, we talked about the apps, uh, genetics. How are we doing for time? We gotta go. Um, Genetics are a big part of it too, and I'm, I'm gonna end here with genetics. Because your DNA is not your destiny. These doctors are understanding genomics and epigenetics. Epigenetics is the switch, the lever that turns the DNA on and off and how it's read. So we can learn how to do things that turn those switches off. So DNA is not our destiny. So you've got things that are less than desirable, go figure that piece out. And then lastly, you can tell I'm passionate about this. We've got lots of good things that we've worked on since 2019. Uh, Rich wrote this article. He says we, but it's he. Rich wrote an article with the predictions, what he saw coming down the path in 2020. And he wrote that right before the pandemic. And it hit the fan. And he nailed every single one of them. He was reading the tea leaves. So if you want to get a copy of the white paper that we wrote, jot down the uh, email address. Rich will send you a copy of it. It's also on the back of the, the table card there if you want that. So I really appreciate your time today, your energy, and obviously, um, you know, hope you enjoyed some of these ideas I found worth sharing. Thanks. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.